This is Five Live Sport with Eleanor Aldroyd. Steve Crossman will be here at nine with the Euroleague show before Stephen Nolan at ten. But for the next hour here on Five Live Sport, we're talking cricket and looking ahead to the deciding test between England and the West Indies starting tomorrow here at Emirates Old Trafford. I've been speaking today to both captains and you'll hear from Joe Root and Jason Holder in the next hour. You'll be able to follow the match in all the usual ways, live ball-by-ball -ball commentary with the Test Match special team on Five Live Sports Extra. There'll be in-play clips via the BBC Sports website and app and TV highlights at 7 p.m. every night. Well, with me for the first part of the show are cricket correspondent Jonathan Agnew and World Cup winner, commentator and the BBC TV's face of cricket, Isha Guha. Hello, both of you. Nice to be here again, Ellie. Here we yes. are again. Hello to you, Ellie. Yeah, look, it's, yes. I tell you what, this test match is, is set up so well, isn't it, really? The series has been Terrific. We've seen some brilliant performances from, from both sides. How are you seeing it, Agus, over the next few Well, years? firstly, yes, I'm very relieved that there is there's, there's a game. You know, I think what the players have achieved, uh, locked away in their bubble and so on, is, is amazing, actually. The level of the cricket they've produced uh, with no crowds, no atmosphere, nothing whatsoever. I think it's been astonishing what they've done. So it, it's, you know, fair, fair play to them, too, that there is this deciding game. It's a huge game for West Indies. I mean, it's a big game for both, obviously. But for the West Indies, possibly Jason Holder to be the first captain to win here for 32 years. That is a massive thing. And you know, when I was playing cricket in the 80s, you wouldn't think for a minute that the West Indies, the West Indies would go that length of time without giving us a good hiding, because they always did. Mm. And yet there's been this incredibly barren stretch in which there's been really an awful lot of poor cricket played by the West Indies. But they look, they're a different team. They've got a terrific captain now. And if they do beat England here over the next five days, they thoroughly deserve it. We've just got to hope that we get a full game in, East, haven't we, really? Yeah, it's not looking great at the moment. It's, it's pretty grim out there. Um, we're expecting showers on Saturday. It's not looking good on Monday. So we're hoping that we will get a result. Um, Agus talked about the importance of the match for the West Indies and what's on the line for them, but they are the current Wisdom Trophy holders. England need to win it back. Um, they have to win the Test match to retrieve the trophy. Uh, and so are they going to be able to enforce a, a victory in such a short amount of time? Well, we might see another change-up of the batting order. Who knows? Um, and it does throw an interesting spotlight on who they decide to select as well based on that. Loads to talk about over the next hour. Uh, let's hear, first of all, from the England captain, Joe Root. There was only one place to start when I spoke to him a bit earlier on, and that was about the return of Jofra Archer to the squad. The last couple of days, he certainly performed well in practice. He's bowling the speed of light again. Uh, he's got a big smile on his face, and he's had a tough week. I think there's no hiding behind that. It's been hard for him, and some of the stuff that he's had to deal with has been quite horrible, really. But as a squad, we've tried to rally around him and, and make sure that he's as good as he can be. And, you know, it's nice to see him back smiling again and enjoying his cricket. And I'm sure if, if selected, he'll be desperate to put in a great performance, as, as we saw in the first Test match. Well, you've named a 14-man squad and Chris Silverwood said you want to play your best bowling attack. Do you know what that actually is? I've got a good idea. I think when you talk about best bowling attack, it's for the conditions that are in front of us. So, I mean, as you can see, there's... Um, covers are on at the minute so it'd be nice to have a look at the wicket in the morning and be really clear on that also Ben's got a little bit of a, a niggle so we'll have to make sure that he's alright in the morning he'll definitely be able to play but it's just how much of an impact he can make with the ball so we have to factor in a number of things ahead of the game but we're blessed with a brilliant squad of players that um, cover all bases and feel that whatever attack we choose to go with um, more than capable of taking 20 wickets So that niggle is that following on from, from him pulling up yeah. on Monday. Yeah, and it's um, it's just lingered a little bit, but it's nothing too serious and nothing really to worry about long term, I don't think. So just manage him very, very well and carefully. It's obviously a, a very precious commodity, the way he's playing at the moment. So, yeah, just have to weigh things up in the morning. Do you have to protect him from himself sometimes? <laughs> it's, it's hard, isn't it? When he's performing as he is, he, he, I think everyone wants to see him do everything uh, as often as possible. So... Yeah, I think with all the players in this time, with the amount of cricket that we're playing in such a short period, it's important that everyone's looked after very well. And, um, you know, Ben definitely more than most, probably. So that could mean potentially that you're a bowler down if you decide that, that Ben isn't really fit to be your fourth seamer, as it were. Well, it depends what balance we want to go with. As I say, we're blessed with some, some brilliant options to choose from. And, you know, 
however we balance the side, we're in for a brilliant attack to, to take on the conditions. We've, as you've pointed out, the weather forecast is, is not brilliant for the next few days. Does that affect the way you would manage the game if you get the choice at, at the toss, for example? There's so much to take into consideration and you know, it'd be nice to have a real good look at the wicket and have an, a better idea of, of what we're dealing with. And until then, it's hard to, to really look too far ahead uh, beyond that point. But I don't think any of the tosses so far this summer have been straightforward and I can't see tomorrow being any different. You kept on Bess in the squad as well as, as, as your spin option. Was there a discussion about maybe having Jack Leach in there as, you know, with, with all the right-handers in this West Indies team? Jack's um, he's a fantastic ball. I think Bessie's got the shirt at the minute and um, deserves his opportunity to, to get another go this week. And he, he's, he's still at, right at the start of his career, he's still learning, and he did a lot of good stuff last week and throughout this series so far. And I think you know, he, he'll be desperate to uh, take another step forward this week as well. How much of a motivation is it knowing that you've, you know, you've got such a great record of winning Test Series or certainly not losing Test Series at home over the next few days here? Yeah, I mean, we, we're very proud of our record in, in, in our own conditions. It's, we've worked very hard at trying to become more consistent when we've been abroad and we've made strides with that this winter um, and the previous couple of winters. In our own conditions, we're generally a quite hard side to, to beat and we expect to, to put in a very good performance this time round and, and hopefully enough to, to win the game and, and to, to win the series for sure. And what kind of a chance do you think you might have at the end of this test match to actually have a bit of a break before the test against Pakistan? Because it's just over a week, isn't there? What, what's the latest state yeah, to play with that? I mean, we have to wait for full confirmation at the end of the game, but um, hopefully guys will be able to get home and uh, spend a few days and then there'll be some strict rules in place, which we'll, we'll definitely follow. But, yeah, we, we just have to make the most of the opportunities that we do get uh, to get home, to stay rested, to stay fresh, see our families and enjoy that time. And then when it comes back to, to playing cricket again, we're, we're fit, fresh and ready to go. Yeah, I bet your little girl's probably changed in, in the two weeks that you've been away. Yeah, she, she has and the pictures that I've seen, definitely, yeah. So it'd be, it'd be lovely to get back home and see them all. We should mention as well the fact you're, you're wearing the, the Ruth Strauss Foundation cap today. It was due to be red for Ruth Day on Saturday, but that's actually been brought forward today. Yeah, that's been brought forward till tomorrow, and um, you know, we're really proud to be supporting a fantastic charity. Um, it's obviously a slight shame that there's going to be no one else in the ground to, to sort of um, appreciate what, what a great charity it is and what a special day. You know, you look back at last year at Lords, and um, you know, it's magical the amount of people that got behind and supported it and hopefully people can do that from home um, and you know watching and listening can get behind what is uh, doing some great things behind the scenes. Well that was Joe Root talking to me a bit earlier on and yes I've got no doubt that both teams will be paying tribute to the late Ruth Strauss uh, before play tomorrow um, and we will well there's lots to talk about isn't there in that Joe Root interview. Let's start, start by talking about Ben Stokes Isha and that news that he you know, we thought when he pulled mm. up, you know, we thought at that point, is there something to worry about? And they were saying, no, nothing to worry about at all. I think it's a quad problem that, he, that he's got. So he's fit to bat, but potentially we might not see him bowl. No, we won't. And so, you know, we'll have to look at how that team comes together. Uh, he was very much used as the enforcer in that second test match in the middle overs where it was a bit drier. He was running in. He can obviously swing the, the old ball, but he was used as the, the bang it in the pitch guy because they didn't have Wood, they didn't have Archer. And so that's why I think they will look at one of those two coming back into the team, probably Archer. Um, but that obviously d depends on his mental state and where he's at. But yeah, it's a huge blow because he is such a, a big player, uh, especially with the ball how do they make up the rest of the team as well um, because if you do decide to bring the likes of James Anderson in um, and you keep Stuart Broad there isn't as much depth with the batting so all those things will need to be considered mm. any question at all that they might have said Jonathan let's just rest him you know, I mean, he is the number three ranked batsman in world cricket now. Yeah. And, you know, number one ranked all-rounder, but number three ranked batsman. Well, they, they, they need to win. So the, the options they have, I mean, they definitely need some pace. So that is going to be Archer or Wood. Uh, Anderson, I think, needs to come in and play here. Uh, he, he obviously didn't play in the last game. He can't drop broad. And you, it may be that Stokes can't bowl. So there is that forecast that we talked about. It looks as static could be a write-off. Could three seamers and a spinner do it? Uh, and others do all the work 
They've got Joe Root as well, of course, which means they could uh, they, they could possibly not play best and they could play four seamers. Mm. And they've got Root to bowl some spin. I mean, they've they just got to decide what the weather's going to look like and there is rain around and, and who is likeliest to get the West Indies out. And that's, that's the question. But I think you, know, it, you are going to be crossing your fingers. You've got Archer, um, sorry, you've got Wood and Anderson in the same side. You know, they, they, they've both got poor recent mm. um, fitness records. So I think, I, I mean, that, w- that would be w- where I'll be going from. I, I would have had 12, and I'll have had best than that 12, and it might be that he, that he, that he does miss out looking at the forecast. It's tough on someone like Chris Wokes, who's got an average of 20 here. Uh, if it was a dry pitch, if we were going to have sun for, for four or five days and they played best, then you'd probably look at Sam Curran, um, the left armour. Uh, he was incredibly useful in that that second test match not only you know picking up key wickets but to create that rough for, for Bess um, I tend to lean with Aggers in the fact that they probably need to go with four pace bowlers mm. do, you, do you really think they they will make the decision when they open the curtains tomorrow morning or get or the covers come off will they leave it that late or do you think that they, they do know who their best bowling line well, is well I think they, they've got yeah, they, they, they'll be 90% there I suspect they'll wait and see how Stokes does shape up in the morning but if they are talking him down he's, he's unlikely to, to to bowl so it is a question of that forecast yeah if if they do field first does that mean that saturday is going to be a blank day as far as their bowls are concerned and then mm. they can get back for the second innings? Well, that's that, that, that's a big question it's a, it's a very difficult decision to to make on on a forecast you know you're expecting it to rain limited time in the game if you leave out the spinner that could come back to, to bite you. So it's, it's another tough one for mm. Joe. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, these unexpected things that kind of keep leaping yeah. out, out at him. In terms of Ben Stokes, as, I mean, you know, we know what a phenomenal all-rounder he is. Do you think that they will have had to say to him, look, Ben, let's not risk you because we know you want to do everything, you know, but on this occasion... We're not going to let you bowl. Well, I think he'll know he's not fit. I mean, you mm. know, if, 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 if you declare yourself fit when you're not, you're not doing anybody any favours. Mm. We've seen that happen, haven't we, in the past? So you, you've just got to be honest. And if he if he if he's not fit, and he's saying this. I'm sorry, that's still niggling. He doesn't bowl. Yeah, it, and thinking about a quad as well, you know, you still have to run between the wickets as a as a batsman, yeah. and and you look at the way he played in that in England's second innings, and really had to kind of force the issue. But even in the first innings, you know. He, it was his slowest test hundred, but he's still pushing fielders when he when he hits it out to the deep. He's still running that first one hard in a test match. That's just the way he is. That's the energy he brings to the crease. And so you don't really want to, to be risking that when you've got such a, a big series around the corner as well. I know there's a lot on the line in this particular test match, but again, that's another. It's a big call to make. Mm. When you're you're rotating your bowlers, as as England have said they want to between this series and then the Pakistan series as well. There are going to have to be some difficult calls, aren't there? And some difficult knocks on doors and and you know, and if you're if you're Joe Root, you've got to be you've mm-hmm. got to be pretty strong, haven't you, to be to be able to save some of your your big bowlers. You know, so so is so is is there an implication that it's easier to tell Chris Wokes because he is the world's <laughs> nicest man that, that he's dropped than telling, you know, Jimmy Anderson or Stuart Broad. He's got to pick your best team. Mm. Yeah, all this, all the resting and rotation, it's, all, it's fine, it's well and good, that's management speak. If you're a player, if you're playing well and you deserve to play, then you should be picked. Because otherwise you lose all faith in the selection system and, and things fall apart. So, yes, you, you can persuade a player that perhaps he's bowled 40 overs in the game before and there's a test match in three days' time. Listen, that's not a good time for you to play. But otherwise, I totally... Dis- I, honestly, if, if, because if you lose faith in that process then you know, what, what does selection become? And so if Chris Wokes is not considered to be one of the top four seam bowlers in the England side, he doesn't play. Because mm. you, you, you can always make an argument for Sam mm. Curran as well, can't you? Just in that, you know, particularly if, if, yeah. there is, if there's a spinner involved and we saw that, a little bit of that in, in the, the previous test and the second test. There's a case for absolutely everyone. It's an incredible position that England are in at the moment that, you know, they have fit players, there's depth... Um, guys coming in can do a job it makes me very excited about the future of this team to be honest and mm. um, when you l- look at the ashes around the corner um, just on that being too nice thing of Chris Wokes you know I, whenever I was dropped I, I, I really hoped that it wasn't because I was too nice <laughs> <laughs> did you think sometimes that it was yeah well it was just easy to drop me and I just thought well no I, I just need to be a bit more kind of uh, 
angry about it, perhaps. <laughs> but, well, Stuart Broad, I mean, yeah. look, look at the fuss he kicked out. They, they can't drop him again. <laughs> I'd love to see Chris Wokes in the diary room, as it's, as it's called, kicking up a stink and saying, you know, we need to be selected. But, but, but he might, might be a nice fellow, but it still hurts. When you're, when you're yeah, dropped, yeah. I mean, no, no one wants to be dropped. No. So mm. you know, and, and he, for, he, for he no might good publicly reason. take it more easily or mm. appear to than some others. But doesn't, believe me, he won't, he won't feel any easier about being dropped than anybody else does. Mm. We're going to talk about uh, Joffre Archer in, 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 about, in a few minutes because Carlos Brathwaite, you know, our TMS friend of the show, um, who's joined us and, and who knows Joffre very well as well. So, so many issues to, to discuss about that. But, I mean, Isha, your, your thoughts about the week that Joffre's had? Yeah. Because, you know, obviously he was... We know that he was self-isolating for five days in the hotel room. He had two negative tests, uh, negative COVID tests, then was able to come back and, and bowl in the nets again. But he was he's, he's talked publicly in his column this week about the racist abuse that he's got from different areas and the fact that people judge him constantly for performing or not performing. Yeah, and, and it, it, it very much feels like that's something he's been carrying for a while and it's all just he's just let it all out. And uh, with the, the backdrop of everything that's going on around the world at the moment, um, you know, he sees Stuart Broad speak up and, and give his opinion and, and be quite honest about how he feels. He probably felt he could do the same. And it's a difficult world. You know, I don't envy the players whatsoever. This, this world of social media where everyone is entitled to their own opinion and, and they can get at you. You know, these are conversations that people will be having in pubs around the world. And, and in their own living rooms um, with their families, but now they can actually direct it at that person and, and that person can see all of these comments. And so for me, just, just from what I saw, I just think he needs to get, get away from social media. I think he just needs to get away from it completely um, so he can just be in the right mental frame. He can focus on life in the bubble with his teammates who fully support him and they just want him to, to be the best he can be as a cricketer naturally when you do something wrong you feel vulnerable and you're worried about what people think about you and especially if you're quite a sensitive person it can really affect you and get to you and and just hearing what he said about feeling judged it's something he's going to have to start managing um, and and speak to Ben Stokes as much as possible because he's been there and he's come out the other side of it they really will have to kind of rally around him whether he needs a break from it I'm not sure Um, whether it is just a case of Joffrey, you need to get off social media right now um, and not even look at anything um, because we want you to be at your best uh, playing for England. The attitude within the England team to social media has changed quite a bit, I guess, over the years, hasn't it? That you know, when Jimmy Anderson was saying the other day that he's extremely relieved that there was no social media no. around when he started his career, but actually they are encouraged to use it quite yeah, a lot. They are, and I, and I, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I mean, I think, I think England have handled him very well. You know, he, he stepped out of line. He, he made a big mistake. He, he did put a, a lot of things in jeopardy by making that decision to go home. And everyone, everyone knows what the mm. situation was. So, I mean, and they had no option but to put him up there in quarantine because that's what they had to do. He might have, he might have caught it. So, but, you know, for him to sit there for five days in that small room uh, without being able to do anything... I mean, that, that, that was punishment enough for me. I mean, I, yeah, they, they find him as well. OK, I'm, I'm glad they didn't go any further than that because it, it was pointless. I, he, he won't go home again. You know, he, he, he knew what he did was wrong. As far as social media is concerned, I, I don't know why he's on it. Mm. I don't know what benefit someone like Joffre Archer gets from being on social media because all you do... Uh, you know, I've had both experiences with social media. I've had a huge amount of support from it when Emma was ill, and it was that was fantastic, and all the nice people came out. Unfortunately, shortly afterwards, they went back into their quiet areas again, and, and everyone else comes back. And it doesn't do anybody any good when you're reading constantly negative stuff about you. Um, it's the Bishop of Leicester who finally convinced me that, to finish social media because he, he announced at the start of a sermon. He said, I, I'm, off, I'm off social media. And I thought it was a bit interesting coming from the bishop. And he said, why surround yourself with so much negativity and darkness? Because what you do is you miss all the lovely stuff that's around you. And that, bing, that was it for me. Mm. And I went straight back and disconnected. And Joffre doesn't need that stuff. And he shouldn't have it. it shouldn't, mm. I mean, it shouldn't be happening. But also, you know, don't, don't, don't be on it. Don't be on it. Mm. It's so much, so much, 
It's like, it's like breath of fresh air not being on there anymore. There, there, there are some players that do use it as an advantage. So Steve Smith, when he was going through his difficult patch, um, he would read everything. And I pff, I don't know how... You've got to be a pretty special I person don't know to how he, soak up he, that he, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but he has spoken about the fact that he sometimes reads it just to kind of motivate him. Or, or for him, it's that mindset of saying, well, I'm going to prove you wrong. In this instance, just, just from what I've read, I, I just feel like he needs to get away from it. Yeah. I mean, if no one should be writing him. that stuff to him, by the way. No, of and, course. I, and I do hope, when well, he said his hand did some to the police, mm. well, let's hope that they, they manage to track something. And that's the right thing. And that's to down do. to the ECB to handle that as well, yeah. isn't it? You know, there comes a point where you have to say, right, th- this, is, th- this is something that I can't deal with myself, you know, and, and, and there is an authority who can deal with it for me, and they should be doing that. But, but it, if it's getting you to a point where you're being very irrational, in your in your thought process and you know you're you're saying i'm not motivated to go and bowl and you have the opportunity to play for england then then that is alarm bells that is saying Mm. there is something wrong there whether it's a quick fix you know the guys can get around him whether you know i I heard today he was bowling at 90 miles an hour on the nets and he's fired up again um hopefully he has kind of got to a place where he can manage it but it's not a for me, I don't think it's a short-term fix. You, you have to really kind of live it every single day, especially if you want to be consistent and balanced and not be on this roller coaster in your head of mm. being irrational and and having to find ways of, of kind of bringing the best out of yourself, you know. And it's it's incredibly tough, you know. I, like I say, I don't envy I don't envy people at all who are going through it. You know, sports people who are on the world stage and. Everyone is picking apart everything that you do. You, you know, you have to be so tough mentally. And, um, yeah, it's it's something that we at the PCA have, have worked incredibly hard with the players on. Um, you have education pieces to, to really just try and open open their eyes and, and help them understand that at times, you know, it's it's throwaway. Mm. It's, it's a pinch of salt. People, you will be news one day and then literally a week later people would have forgotten about it and and those people's people's opinions don't matter the people's opinions you know the people whose opinions matter are your, your, your teammates your coaches your family and friends and that's and, and the rest is just noise and you've got to seek out you've got to seek out those people and you've you've got to yeah you've got to have those people around you consistently um to get you through those tough times mm. um you know there's no accountability at all on social media for for what people say it's yeah it's it's something that you know there's a wider issue globally of, of what's going on um it can be used in in some ways to to be quite a positive thing as well but uh, yeah just just with this particular case i think um he needs to just try and try and get away from it well, as I said earlier on, the West Indies all-rounder and T20 World Cup winner Carlos Brathwaite has been part of our team on TMS over this series, and he's he's with us now. I, I mean, Carlos, if you could give Joffre advice about how to use social media, what would you say to him? Because, I mean, he clearly likes it, and it, it, it gives him a lot in lots of ways. Um, I think he's closer to being a social media expert than I am. Um, I'm a bit more reserved. I think it's two different characters. Joffre is more out there and... He got all these quirky things, all the TikToks and stuff. I just like posting pictures of myself every once in a while. (laughs) Um, So I wouldn't really give advice per se, um, but I guess it would be more of a warning just to be wary of what you post, understand the backlash that you can receive. Mm. Um, And as with most things, the higher it can take you, the further down it can pull you as well. Um, So just be wary. Um, I saw on his social media um, that he was racially abused and regardless of if you use it, use social media a lot or not, that's just not on. Um, but yeah, I mean, his social media is a, a source of entertainment for me as well. So keep the entertainment coming, but just be wary of the backlash if there is any. I think he makes a good point in that as a social media user, you have to be very clear in your head about how much of yourself you want to put out there into the world um, because you do leave yourself open to being a target at times mm. um, just by how much you divulge um, and and you have to make a decision as a person how, how much you know you want to kind of be vulnerable in a way mm. um, you know some people do it and it's a positive thing because 
you're essentially being an inspiration, a role model to others as to, to how to kind of get through a particular situation or experiences that you've encountered. Um, but you have to be prepared to, to talk about it and and understand that people will question you no matter what you've said. Mm. So that, yeah, that that is a, a very valid point for sure. Uh, have you been in touch with Joffre? Yeah, I have. Um, briefly, again, I, I want to respect his privacy, so I don't want to be bombarding him. Obviously, no, I kind of a dual role as friend and broadcaster. Um, sometimes it could be hard to limit what you do say on mic, so the less I know, the less I can dive out. So for me, it's just always, every time I see something come out, I would always make reference to it, say I've seen this, I've seen that, um, and I'm here to offer support if you need it. Um, that would have translated into a few convos and they would have offered my opinions. But for me, I, the way I like to deal with things is that I got a small circle of family and friends that I always go back to. So even though I may be giving someone advice the way I see it, I always tell them, consult your small circle and do what you think is right by them because they know you better than I would know you as close friends as we are or whatever. So my advice is my advice, but before you make a decision, consult your, your close friends and family. With, without divulging anything private, do you think he's in the right frame of mind to be playing in a test match starting tomorrow? I hope so. It could be dangerous for the West Indies um, <laughs> because he's the type of character that when he does have something to prove, um, he could be at his best or close to it. Um, I remember the World Cup game against us last year and I think that was the first game he'd played against the West Indies since he started representing England. You could just sense um, that he had some fire in his eyes. Um, he got some stick after the first innings in Southampton. We saw how he came out of bowl in the second innings. So I mean, for his career moving forward, we don't want that he needs that fire lit under him each time he needs to go and perform. But that being said, where he at right here, right now, if he is selected tomorrow, I think he has a point to prove. So he could be dangerous for the West Indies. Do you think he's, his treatment in this country, I mean, bearing in mind, as we say, he's, he's so new, so new to this England team, you know, just two series and the impact he's made has been extraordinary already. But do you think he's been fairly treated? Um, no. Um, and I, I, I saw it with Kevin Peterson as well. Um, there is the traditional English way of doing it by the book, um, but all good teams need the X factor. I think he brings that X factor. I thought Kevin Peterson brought that X factor. Um, and out of the two players that I mentioned, England would have won World Cups with both of them and they would have played big roles. So whilst there is um, a place and you're hoping that majority of your team, 75% are consistent, um, they do everything by the book, they're always early, they eat right, they do this, they do that. You do need that rogue, not saying that he is, but every team needs that rogue, that X factor that doesn't play by the rules, rip the, um, the pages out of the book and do it my way type of character. Um, and if you think about it, Ben Stokes not too long ago was seen as that type of character, now he's seen as a leader. If England can find a way to transform um, Joffre into the leader that Ben Stokes has become, keeping his X factor on field performance, then those are two serious cricketers to be contending with, it, contending with for the next five to ten years. That's so interesting, that comparison. I hadn't thought about, you know, that Peterson character, the, the, the person who, who gets all this criticism but still is this, this extraordinary game-changing player, he should, you know. And, and, and it's right, isn't it, that not everybody has to toe the line in the same way and be the same, the same person. It's how you manage them. Um, and that comes down to the people around him, um, not only in the team, the captain, it's the, the management group as well. And, but you also have to look out for those players who aren't like that and who get frustrated by one rule for one and another rule for another. And that's that's all part of team sports, isn't it? Mm. Um, you, you see it, you see it in pretty much every team around the world. It's not just cricket. And ultimately, what do you want? You want to get the best out of your players. How do you get the best out of that player? 
but also look after the rest of the teammates. Um, it's it, yeah. it's fascinating. They're not robots. They are not no. robots. Look, Isha, thank you very much indeed. We're going to let you go because you've got another busy day to prepare for Thanks, tomorrow Ellie. in your multiple roles as TV presenter, TV commentator and radio commentator as well. And let's talk about the West Indies um, with you, Carlos, for a bit. Um, and I had a little bit of a chat earlier on with West Indies captain Jason Holder. Have a listen to this. He's been talking about how he's approaching this final test of the series. Yeah, we don't want to get too caught up with the end result. It's more or less just playing some solid cricket over these next couple of days. England have been playing some really good cricket in this series. It's been highly competitive and we expect a really good contest from both teams. Yeah, I've taken it day by day, session by session, and we're not getting too far ahead of ourselves. Have you had a sense of how the reaction's been back in the Caribbean to, to how you've done over here and even around the world? Yeah, the, the responses from people around the world have been very, very positive. You know, everybody's loved so far what we've done. Both teams particularly, I think both teams should be highlighted for what they've done. It's a, it's a massive step into taking, to come coming over here and playing cricket and, and resuming cricket. And then obviously what's been going on in the world. But yeah, um, it's been well received and hopefully it'll continue to entertain everyone around the world. I want to ask you about your, the achievements of your own team, but I wanted to ask you about Joffre Archer because it sounds like he's had quite a difficult week and I know that he's got a lot of friends in, in, in your team as well. Have you been in touch with him? Yeah, I haven't seen him as yet, you know, um, but I'm, I'll be sure to catch up with him probably over the next couple of days, you know, um, and just sad um, the way everything is played out, you know, hopefully, you know, we can all get a grip of, of what has been happening and, and understand, you know, what he's feeling, you know, I think this is a perfect opportunity again for us to rally around him, you know, and un unite and make sure that, you know, that these things are eradicated as much as they possibly can. Um, it's not good that it's been happening and I don't, I don't think anybody who's in issues would, would like it happening to them, so... You know, hopefully we can show him some support. You know, he can get over this, and you know, we all crack on with, with what we do. In terms of your team, so bowled so brilliantly in Southampton. Um, it didn't seem quite so easy, certainly in the first innings here um, a few days ago. Do you have the option to rotate your 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 seamers at all, or will you? feel pretty much the same team as you did in the, the second test? What I can guarantee is that the team that we feel uh, will be the best team we think has the chance to win this game. You know, Winning this game is priority for us. You know, We think that we've got a squad with any member coming in being capable to do the job for us. You know, But it's more or less picking the best team uh, suited for the conditions that we're faced with. So again, we'll see how the wicket pulls up tomorrow. I heard there's a bit of weather around, bad weather around. So all these things could play into the fact of selecting a, a site. Could we be seeing Raheem Cornwall for the first time? In this yeah, series. I mean, it's, it's always a possibility. Again, um, I haven't seen a wicket today, you know, it's been cut undercover all day, so I'll definitely take a look at it tomorrow morning and then we'll make our final decision. Tell us about him. He's such a, an imposing figure. What's he like as a, as a player? He's very, very funny. You know, a lot of people don't know that he's actually a really funny character. Um, he doesn't really say much, but when he does say something, it's very, very impactful and everybody does have a good smile over it. But yeah, his impact so far in international cricket has been significant for us. You know, he's won us a game in the last test series that we've played. And, you know, he's done really well for us, um, well, for himself in regional cricket as well, too. So I think the sky's the limit for him. You know, he's just waiting for his opportunity. And if it comes, I'm sure he'll, he'll take it with both hands. And you've had some, some players who've got runs for you on, on the board. People like, I mean, Craig Brathwaite, you must be pleased with the way he's, you know, started things off for you at the top. Yeah, of Craig the is outstanding. You know, he's been our leading batsman for a number of years. And, you know, what he's doing, I, I'm just not, it's not surprising to me. You know, Craig has been one of our most consistent players. To me, I like, like the way he goes about his business and it's really good to see him back in the runs. I know he's looking for 100. He hasn't gotten his yet. He's gone two half centuries so far, but you know, I think, I think a big score is around the corner for him. You know, hopefully he can get it for us in this game. Can I ask you one very quick final one about Kimar Roach? Because he is three wickets away from getting 200 test wickets and he'd be the first person to do that since the great Kirtley Ambrose. What would that mean to him and to you as a team? I'm sure Kimura are getting 200 test wickets in this test match and us winning this test match will be a, a memory for a, lot, for a lifetime. So we're all behind him. We hope that he can come at trunks for us. You know, he's done it for, um, over, over the years and he's done it for us on, on a number of occasions. So let's hope that this test match is very, very impactful for him and it's one that we could, we could hopefully help him to remember in, in years to come. Well, that was Jason Holder, who I spoke to a bit earlier on. Carlos, I, I will talk about the, the batting in a second, but in bowling, in, in, in bowling terms, have they got the option to rotate their pacemen? Because Shannon Gabriel obviously was not the bowler he was in Southampton when it came to the first test here. They, the West Indies don't have the luxury of the quality that England had on the bench. Um, do they have capable enough fast bowlers in the next two or three years to take over from this quartet? I think they do. 
But right this minute, um, Chamar Holder making his debut into a must-win game, I think that would be a little too tough. Um, I'd much rather see Alzari or Shannon sacrificed. Um, and when I say sacrifice, is because I think those four guys have been building a real solid connection as an attack. Um, and to break it up would be a sacrifice, although they didn't do as well as they wanted to in the second test. Um, and I'd love to see Racking Cornwall get a goal, not only because of the extra option with the spin, um, but just a little more solidity with the bat as well. Though Rich and Jason Holder would have carried and propped up the batting for a few series. Um, unfortunately, they haven't been able to get a score. So adding the extra batting option at nine um, and then Kimar and one of Alzari or Shannon, I think would be the safer option. Um, you want to win every test. But the truth in the matter is you don't need to win this one. So with selection, with the weather around, you want to not really hedge your bets because you want to win. But you also want to be smart enough to have enough batting death that you don't lose four wickets for... 50 runs is the way they did with the second new ball in the second test. Jonathan Angie's back with us as well, I should mention. Um, and we'd, we've, we, we talked about, I remember sitting in Southampton before the first test and you, you talked about Shamar Brooks and you told us all about him and about how good he was going to be. And he, he's definitely scored, scored some runs. I suppose he and Brathwaite and Blackwood have all scored runs, but maybe not the, the huge runs that they would like them to get. Yeah, funny enough, I had a chat with him and <laughs> he calls me childhood friend because we go way <laughs> back from uh, primary school cricket. He was like, childhood friend, you know that what you said about me really helps to push me. I always, th when, I go, when he goes up to bat, he always remember me saying um, he's the breakout star of the series and he tries not to let me down. So that was a little emotional. <laughs> oh, really? So, so actually, by, by doing that on our first preview show, you've given Shamar Brooks that little bit of a, an extra incentive. Apparently, apparently. Um, but no, we, uh, we also went on to chat on uh, just about him needing to carry on. Um, and I was very frank, and I said, look, you get to 40 very easily, you've gotten your couple 50s, but then you're getting stuck, and as a result, the whole innings losing rhythm. And he was aware, he was very upfront, and he admitted that as well, because he said the same thing for Craig. They're flowing nicely, but then they're getting stuck and not being able to transfer. When they go back down the gears to get back up through them and go on to eventually get a century and maybe even turn it to a big score. Um, so it is for three of those guys who are in form because no one is ever, no batting lineup or members of a batting unit is always in form. You always have the one or two guys that will be struggling. So it's on the guys that are in form, not only to get 40, 50 and 60, but to go on and get 110, 120, 130, etc. So the, the onus is on those guys to carry your Shea Hopes, your John Campbells. Um, I mean, Roston hasn't been doing badly, but he hasn't set the world alight either, like those three have. Um, so it's for three of those guys to prop up the rest of the batting lineup. Mm. I know that Jonathan and I are, are equally excited about the prospect of seeing Raheem Cornwall because we've, we've watched him. We've watched him training, haven't we, Jonathan? Yes. We've seen him warming up and yeah, absolutely. You know. I mean, look, he can bowl. Let's, mm. let's, let's put that away for a start. It's just the mobility, isn't it? I mean, he's a very, very big man. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's. If you think of the, the, the battles that England have had with with Samit Patel, I mean, you know, mm. in terms of size. You know, Sam, it looks like a stick insect compared to this fellow. I mean, he's, in, he's huge. And yeah. so it'll be fascinating to see how he plays. But, you know, the bottom line is he can bowl. And if England are going to have at least three left-handers in their side, which they, they will have at least three, I'd imagine, then you know, if, if the pitch is anything like we saw the, the previous match, then I think he would have a, a part to play. And, I'd, 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 you know, I'd love to see him. And, and they, they spent a lot of time working with him uh, during the match on the pitches on the side and, and so on. It looked as if they... It, it didn't look as if it was just here for, for the ride, put it that way. Mm. They, they were investing a lot of time with him. The, the coach, Phil Simmons, was, was batting against him and so on. So it, it would be excellent. And, 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 you know, he, he's probably their best bet, I think, because I think Gabriel probably has uh, blown his stack. He's given everything. You know, can he come well, back he, he and was do injured. it again? He was injured before lockdown, wasn't he? He had a yeah. serious mm. ankle injury. Yeah, I mean, it'd be asking an awful lot mm. of him to come back. So it might be that they do, do, do play too two spinners we shall see are we going to see big Rakim? I hope so um, 
And obviously, the, the most daunting thing about him is his size, and everyone comments on his size. But the England Lions players that went down to the Caribbean a few years ago would know about his quality. Um, I think in three, four day games, he got 30 something wickets um, and absolutely decimated the England Lions um, batting lineup. And a lot of those guys would have gone on to play international cricket since. So if you take his size and lack of mobility out of the equation. He's a fantastic cricketer and I think test cricket and four day cricket suits him a lot better than short format stuff. He's an excellent slip fielder. Um, he'll bowl he'll bowl his overs. You wouldn't ever be fined for slow over rate. He stands by the stumps <laughs> and he rips it. Um, and he's good at slip as they say and a very capable number eight, number nine. He can get you a test hundred eventually as well. So I love to see him play and I love to see him introduce himself to the English public um, and let the English public see what the persons in the West Indies already know that Rakim Corner was a fantastic cricketer. Carlos, we look forward to seeing you in the morning. Thank you very much indeed. Carlos Brathwaite, part of the Test Match special team uh, for the third Test Match at Old Trafford, which starts tomorrow morning. This is Five Live Sport with Eleanor Aldroyd. Well, we've talked about the West Indies' spin options, but what about England's spin options? One man who knows the two key spinners in this England team better than most is Somerset's very own and Test Match Special's very own Vic Marks, who joins us for the first time in this series. How lovely to see you. Well, I was going to say it's absolutely lovely to be here, but I'm, I'm just getting and used to this bubble existence. So <laughs> I'm not entirely sure yet. You'll get it. You'll get it eventually. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. We're all two test matches in, so it's, yeah, it's yeah. fine. It's all routine for you, but I'm still in shock. Okay. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> so we see we saw Don Best bowling in the last test match. Yeah. We haven't got Jack Leach in the squad for this test. Was it was it an option? Do you think that England could have taken? They could have done. Um, I'm actually quite in favour. There's rotation going on with the seam bowlers, the pace bowlers. I would not be averse to a bit of rotation with the spinners. But with the spinners, they seem to have a pecking order rather than a rotation. And at the moment, Don Bess is number one. And I'm feeling a bit... I mean, I, I've got great admiration for both of those guys. Don, Be uh, Don Bess, actually, he was taught by my daughter, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> really? <laughs> and went to the same school. And he's a brilliant sort of charismatic, quite a lively character who impresses everyone with his sheer enthusiasm. And he's done brilliantly well. But so's Jack. <laughs> uh, it's odd, down in Somerset, <clears throat> they have never preferred Dom to Jack. Mm. Uh, and what worries me for, from the Leach perspective, A, is there is a case, a tactical case, for playing a left-arm spinner if he's on top of his game against a team that has 10 or possibly 11 right-handers. Um, but also, I worry about the fact that if he's going to be on the sidelines for so long, he's had so many sort of hiccups, no, no blame to him along the way. If he doesn't get an opportunity soon, he won't become an option because he'll be so divorced from playing this game that he, he won't be in the groove. He can't go off and play at the moment for anyone else. Um, so I think they might be missing a trick. I know, and it's a, it, Bess has done well, but not brilliantly. Mm. Um, so why do, why do you think he's the... I mean, because, you know, as you say, Jack Leach last year was an, an iconic figure in, in the summer. You know, what he did against yeah, Ireland yeah. at Lords and then what he did at, at Headingley with Ben Stokes. I mean, ironically, that's, that's the pro is that the part of the problem, that he's become an iconic figure for his batting rather than his bowling? <laughs> well, he had an astonishing year with that fantastic one not out. Yeah. which was slightly better than his 92 <laughs> <laughs> against Lords, Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this was astonishing. Uh, but he is a left-arm spinner. And actually, you look at his record against Australia, of all people. Australia is the hardest team to play against in many, many ways. And it was, it was good. It wasn't brilliant, but it was good. So I think it's easy to lose sight of that. Dom is such a good all-round cricketer. He's brilliant in the field. We haven't seen that much, but I promise you, he, you know, he can do things in the field that most people can't. He could get you some runs, well, in a more sort of convincing way than Jack. Um, and he's got this self-belief. But Jack is quite a tough cricketer as well. So I'm, I'm feeling a bit sorry for Leach that, if not in the team, I don't understand why he doesn't get in the squad because we talk about having options. Well, he gives you another option, but he never gets in the squad. Now, whether, you know, 
it's because he hasn't played for so long now. He's had so many setbacks, all these illnesses in the winter. Um, whether that's a factor, I hope it's not because that in the practice games he went for a few. Uh, because I saw some of the practice games, and in practice games, people don't take spinners seriously. <laughs> they just whack them out the ground. And when he was getting hit, it wasn't through a stream of awful deliveries. It's just that it's a practice match, I will smash it, and they did. And he looked slightly the more vulnerable bowler in that. But anyway, uh, of course, you know, from a Somerset perspective, still no one thanks us for producing two <laughs> spinners on turning pitches. Instead, I don't know whether it's been carried over to next year. We're 12 points down. We're, we're bottom of the t first division. <laughs> and we produce the only two spinners that are applicable at the moment. Yeah. So do you think that England have, uh, have taken a rather a, a blunt instrument approach to their spinners, Jonathan? Um, well, they seem to be showing more loyalty than they do with the seam bowlers. Because I, I, actually, that, that Joe Root interview that you played, he talks about Don Bess owning the shirt at the moment, mm. which is exactly the expression that Stuart Broad used when actually they took the shirt off him at Southampton. <laughs> I mean, if anyone deserved the shirt, it was Stuart Broad. And so we're, we're back on that rotation thing again. I mean, I, I have I've already said what I think about it. I think from a player's perspective, I think it's, it's really hard to get your head around the fact that you're you're not playing a match in which you deserve to play and other thing it creates all sorts of difficulties with with with, with selection and so on but they could easily have played leech of trouble we don't know how he's bowling do we you know well, we haven't we seen him for so long we don't know how he's bowling they it, it, mm. it would make sense that all the right handers in the west indies decide to play the left arm spinner but but i think they are being loyal to best because of what he did in south africa which is when he stepped in with no practice either incidentally because yeah. of all the illness and so on that he had had and he did a great job there, so I'm, I'm, I'm all for loyalty. Mm. But it's hard that there, there is pecking order for one and rotation for the other, and it's sort of, it's the common approach towards spin. Well, they can play every game and they can bowl for f five hours on the trot <laughs> because they're only step and fetch it, as Balf used to say. Um, but I'm not sure that's necessarily true. But what worries me is that they might get to a stage sometime this summer where they want to play Leach. Now, as far as all the pace bowlers are concerned at the moment, they are in the happy position that their six pace bowlers have all played a game in the last two weeks. So they're all kind of in the groove. Mm. And they could pluck any one of those six out and feel confident he'll be all right. Mm. With Leach, the longer you leave it in this peculiar summer, the, longer, the bigger the risk that he won't be quite right because he hasn't played. So I would want to take a holistic view of this summer in a way and get Leach into the action so you have got that option and you know he's OK. Um, and I also have a feeling that, although it's wet and horrible, if it was just a dry five days, I still think potentially your left-arm mm. spinner, if he's bowling well, is more likely to get you wickets at the end of the game. Well, look, oh, but I love Don Bess. <laughs> yes, well, I know. It feels like I'm asking you to choose between your children, actually. Well, isn't it? yeah, <laughs> well, they're but, not my children, well, but, no. but I have a lot of time for both of them. And mm. what's amazing is that they have such a, a, a good relationship themselves. They find themselves competing, as they have done down at Somerset. Uh, and I think it's genuine when you hear them talk about one another. Dom kind of looks up to Jack. I talked to him. I talked to him. As soon as I got picked for that first game, Jack came over and we had a long chat and all that sort of stuff. They do have a genuinely close relationship and work together, along with Moen. Mm. I mean, that's uh, unusual in a way. And I don't think they're kind of bluffing. They're not just saying it. Well, look, let's look in ahead just, just in a more general sense to the game tomorrow because with everything crossed, we are going to get a, a decent day's play tomorrow. Um, forecast of the weekend, as you said, is a little bit iffier. But we've all, uh, and Victor, you're going to have to do this, we've all had to get used to different ways of doing things over the last few weeks, not least the players. And the England opener, Dom Sibley, made history for all the wrong reasons in the last test. He's been telling Alison Mitchell about that. But first, a quick one on the return of Joffre Archer in the nets. It was good to have Joffre back yesterday and we had a we were chatting yesterday, actually, and it was um, it was good to have him back. He seemed in good spirits. Yeah, he bowled quickly in the nets as well. So, uh, and I was I, I I was facing him. I was next to Rory Burns, and we were facing him yesterday in the nets. They had the speed gun out, so he was steaming in, and um, yeah, he bowled very well. And uh, yeah, he seems in good spirits. And uh, look, I know that he's uh, he's obviously had a tough a tough few days, and uh, obviously the racial abuse is obviously unacceptable, and the stuff that he's had online and. Yeah. You know, as, as a squad, we, we're rallying around him and we want to get around him as much as possible and make sure that he feels good and, yeah, just make sure he's in a good place. That's good to know. Do you know that you're also going to be the answer to a pub trivia question in future? 
in terms of who was the first cricketer to inadvertently break the saliva rule. <laughs> what, what happened with that during the second test match? Well, to be honest, I'd never really get involved with shining the ball. And um, I was I was at mid-off because I wasn't in the slips this, this game. I was at mid-off. You always got the ball and then you see the ball and you're trying to shine it. And I was fine. I'd done it all for maybe two, three, four hours. Fine, nothing. But it was a review and I was still watching the screen. And you know when you're like focusing on something else and suddenly your attention, you know, goes away from what you should be doing and just like natural habit, I just went like that. And I said to Wokesy, obviously I'm close mate with Wokesy. Um, I said to Wokesy straight away, I was like, oh, mate, I've just put like slime on the ball, what should I do? And he said, I'll oh, just tell the umpires, like, you won't get in trouble. And I was thinking, no, 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 I swear, I don't want to get fined or anything like that. Like, but no, nah, I just told them and they were very chilled about it, the umpires. I think it was, they just said, like, make sure you just be honest and... So obviously the cameras might pick it up and it might look worse if you don't say anything. Yeah. So yeah, it was just, honestly, it was just a, it was one of those moments, like, cause you're so used to doing it through the amount of years I've been playing cricket. And then as soon as my focus got taken off the ball and I was watching the review, it was almost just second nature. So yeah, it was obviously not ideal, but um, yeah, it's just part of the new norm, isn't it? <laughs> Well, that was Dom Sibley speaking to Alison Mitchell and Jim Maxwell on the Stumped podcast. And if you want to hear that full interview, you can download the Stumped podcast via BBC Sounds and all the usual places. That was that was a, a moment that we never thought we would talk about, Jonathan, wasn't it? It's the point where the umpires are having to get little sachets of antibacterial well, wipes on the ball. I sort of disagree because I thought it would happen more often. I think it's, it's incredible, really, that that's the only incident. You know, if you think how much... That's what a natural thing it is. And it's interesting how he said that it wasn't... He, his mind was off the ball. He got the ball in his hand. What, what does a cricketer do when he's got a cricket ball in his hand? Well, he he, he rubs some you know, <laughs> some spit into it. He just it's just what you do, and it's amazing, really, that all the bowlers have, have actually managed to avoid doing that and the, and the penalty runs that, that go with it. So we don't actually know whether the sanitizer has an impact on the ball very much. But that'd be an interesting thing. Whether it's worth, it's worth having a... It's worth doing it once or twice to see if the umpire's sanitizing kit makes the ball reverse well, swing or something. What's that Andy Saltzman been doing then? Well, no, no. <laughs> so we need to know that. But he didn't do anything after the sanitizer was applied. But, I mean, doesn't it say everything about these bizarre games that the, that the ball actually had to be rubbed in, in some sort of sterilising mm. ointment for it to be used to get it's 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 a very strange and I'll, I'll go back to the point that i said earlier i think it's it's fantastic that the players have produced the level of cricket that mm. they have despite all those crazy things that are going on at the same time what has it been like watching it from from well, at, at home vic well it's been good it surpassed my expectations for the reasons agas has just pointed out that you know the game has suddenly taken over and you stop talking about the pandemic or the weirdness of it. So I, I've admired hugely the absolute intensity of the cricket of both sides and it's been a good spectacle. Um, I'm actually assuming that this is the first time I'm actually going to watch it live and in a way I don't think it's going to be as good if, because you, you see the vast empty expenses and obviously you glimpse them on the television as well but the players have ensured that it's been worthwhile. We've had two good games that have been tight at the end which is a bit of, bit of a bonus but you know it's been clear that both teams in the best possible way are absolutely committed to trying to win this trophy win the game uh, and it's worked well. It's better than I imagined. Mm. And, and the intensity with which, that you know, th th well, I mean, Ben Stokes obviously approaching mm. it in the way that Ben Stokes always does. But, but, but everybody's, you've had the sense that people care passionately about being able to play the game they love and, and do what they do. And it's it con conveyed itself, hopefully, as, as Vic says, through the, the TV screens yeah, and but, radio as well. But then you're a professional cricketer and you're playing mm. a test match. So, <clears throat> you know, I'd be disappointed if the players couldn't lift themselves. I mean, Old Trafford today looked like Grace Road when the new Vic Marks is coming to play a championship match and it's <laughs> completely deserted. So we are used to it. And, and you've, you do have to create your own, your own atmosphere. You've, you've got to do it. And, and I think you know, both teams have actually managed to do it very well. Who are you most looking forward to seeing over the next few days, Vic? If we get five days of play, which, you know, hopefully we will, in a completed game. Which is this going to go? Because it feels like it's quite finely poised. Well, if, if the weather doesn't intervene, you've got to fancy England after the last match, I think, with whichever team they pick. Uh, certainly a, a stronger bowling attack in terms of their physique or their status of their physique. But actually, the guys I think I'd like to see live that I've enjoyed watching 
I practically never heard of before this series, although I obviously knew about Jermaine Blackwood, but I love watching him back. Mm. I like watching Shamar Brooks back. Mm. He's a real old stylist. Uh, he just gets out when he gets about 50. So, in a way, I'm looking forward to those new guys. I've seen the England guys. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on, on, on Don Best. There's a suggestion. It's only a sort of small percentage. They might not play a spinner at all, England, of course. Mm. It's possible. Mm. And just have Joe Root, especially if the weather looks rubbish. But it's those two West Indian guys I've enjoyed watching because they're fresh and unusual and slightly in Blackwood. You never quite know what Blackwood's going to do. It might be terrible, it might be brilliant. Um, so I like him and I want to see a bit more of Brooks. I want to see Ollie Pope get some runs because that's a real treat and he, he hasn't got going yet. Um, so I, I hope he gets a chance. But Raheem Cornwall, I mean, there's something, some sort of fascination. Uh, yeah, I know, for, I want to see him too, but I don't but, think he's going to play, is he? Well, I don't know. They're, well, we, well they're, they're we think they're, 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 there were hints. Yeah. I think there have been quite a few hints dropped, and Jason Holder spoke with a great deal of enthusiasm about him when I asked him. But it just shows, you know, if he, if he plays international cricket I mean, and people see him, you know, people, you, 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 it, again, suggests and demonstrates you do not have to be a, as fit as a butcher's dog and, you know, the... the, the, the to, to go out and play international sport, and, and, for, and he, he may well be an inspiration to a number of people who are watching. But I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing him if he does play. Well, look, I'm sure everyone's going to really look forward to hearing both of you on Test Match Special, ball by ball commentary on Five Live Sports Extra, and through the BBC Sounds app from 10:25 tomorrow morning. You can watch in play clips via the BBC Sport website and app, and don't forget TV highlights at 7 p.m. every night on BBC Two.